Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you Hello, saints. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. And uh, Father, we ask for your wisdom today, your discernment today. Um, God, we thank you for giving us these revelations, Lord, so that we know what's going on down the road and people can come back and study these things and um, and realize what is the authority and the power that you're giving to your people in these days and that you're bringing a wonderful deliverance to your people in these days. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right, saints, I want to share a revelation with you, a wonderful revelation concerning the kingdom authority of the Davids uh, who are about to appear here. The first one is about gifts of healings, and it was given to Eve Brast. Uh, she had uh, two dreams about this, uh, the first one on in February of 2017. She said, I dreamed I was in the spirit and everything was white all around me. And I would consider that a place of holiness and purity. I saw David dressed in a light blue denim long sleeve shirt and jeans. And I believe this represents the wilderness man-child Davids in whom Jesus lives by the spirit and anointing. And... Um, Jesus came in the body of the Son of David to save, to heal, to deliver, to provide the benefits of the kingdom of God to his people. And history always repeats, that which hath been is that which shall be. And there's no new thing under the sun, he said. Well, this time Jesus is coming again in a body of David's to do the same thing. He will come in spirit word and anointing as he did in the prophets of old. 1 Peter 1 and 10 says, Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto the Spirit of Christ which was in them. Uh, the Lord has taught me that um, they too were a stone that the builders rejected. Uh, and in these days also there are stones that the builder rejected, the ones in whom the Spirit of Christ lives by his word and by his Spirit. And uh, she went on to say, I watched as a silver Caret rack came down from above. I believe this is talking about gifts of healings from heaven. And was placed into his hands. The rack was double the size of that they are in real life. I believe this probably means a double healing anointing of the greater works which Jesus spoke about. She said, Corets are um, used by surgeons to scrape dead tissue from wounds and promote healthy bleeding of the tissue so that it might begin to heal. She said, this rack was empty of physical corets, which I believe means that the Davids will use no works of man for healing, just as Jesus and his disciples did. She said, I believe this is a representative of a double-portioned gift that David has been given for healing. Um, there were hurting individuals sitting around him in different chairs, and he would take the caret rack around to each one of them and open it up to them to show them something. And as he did this, their eyes were opened and they were healed of whatever problems they had been afflicted with. I believe that this is God's tools for spiritual and physical healing 
And uh, they are the blood sacrifice and the promises of the word, which uh, bring faith. And, of course, when we preach the gospel, the real gospel, the full gospel, um, people believe all of the benefits of the kingdom, not just you get be saved when you leave this place, right? So Eve said, um, I asked Father for a word by faith at random concerning the rack of carets that David gave, that Father gave to David, and my finger was on thrones, thrones, in Revelation 20 and 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. So it's dominion and authority to bring, as we can see so far, healing and judgment. And she said, this reminds me of the jeweled ring with the five stones that represents authority and judgment. And this, this is uh, in the next revelation, and I'll share it with you in a few minutes. So, uh, as it was with David, who was the head of the church of that day, Jesus, in the body of the latter reign, David's, will exercise his dominion and authority. Okay, I'll share that with you about the jeweled ring in a few minutes. But then she had this dream on February the 28th. This is dream number two. She said, I dreamed that we were at a meeting at Jeff and Sandy's. I was uh, standing in the living room facing the large window that looks out onto the porch, the front porch. And I believe the large window represents great spiritual sight. You know, we are a house ourselves, you know. But um, this is a, a large window because there's great spiritual sight or insight given to Eve as a type of the bride for, for the last Adam, Jesus she said, I was wearing my T-shirt with the smiley face that had duct tape over the mouth, which says, quote, silence is golden. Duct tape is silver. All right. And I believe that this represents the end of the political and church faction against the bride and the man-child because of one of Ken Dewey's prophecies, which states, I will shut the mouth of the arrogant, and silence will be golden. That's interesting. The silence will be golden. Because, of course, they talk, talk, talk a lot, and a lot of lies, and, and criticisms, and anger, and slander, and so on and so forth. But the Lord's going to put a stop to it. It was interesting how she got this in her dream, and um, and he also got this, you know. And she said, uh, David and Michael came up to me and wanted to pray for me. And David placed his right hand on the middle of my back and his left hand on my diaphragm under, over, excuse me, over the duct tape, the duct tape which was on the mouth of the smiley face, right? He then began to pray in the Spirit over me, and he then took his right hand off my back and placed it over the duct tape. And with his left hand, he began to draw something out of me with a pulling motion. And I believe that this could be the last remnants of faction taken out of the bride's body by the healing gift of the Davids. There's more than one way to get people that turn factious out of the body, of course. He just usually makes them very angry and they storm off but um, for no reason. But, uh, but in this case, there is a healing. So, I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's even better. Praise God. In my opinion, that's, a, that's a, a more hopeful sign, I think. She said, I asked Father for a word concerning what David drew out of me. 
in prayer, and my finger was on faithfulness from Second Chronicles 32 and 1. Uh, here it is in the context, and it actually starts in the chapter before, Second Chronicles uh, 31 and 20. Thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and he wrought that which was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all of his heart and prospered. Now, here's the, the other verse, but I want to say first about um, Hezekiah, that he was a type of the man-child who was caught up to the house of the Lord on the third day. And, and of course, he's talking about this faithfulness, but here's what's going to come of it, right? 32 and 1, the very next verse. After these things and this faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fortified cities and thought to win them for himself. Yep, and so, and down in verse 21, and it says, And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. Well, of course, this has become known to us this army was smitten in this text, and the bride, Jerusalem, was not touched by them. This uh, represents the defeat of the factious army of demons arrayed against the government and the church, since we, we've been shown that there is a parallel between what's going on in the church and what is going on in the government. And you can see what's happened there in the government, obviously, People have gone totally nuts. Sinners, by the way, have gone totally nuts. And the whole world can see them. Well, the same thing's happening, you know, in the church. And uh, after this, he went over to Sandy, who was dressed in a maroon dress shirt and tan dress slacks, and took her by both hands. Immediately, Sandy's leg grew out as she lifted her off her wheelchair into a standing position. Uh, once again, excuse me, once standing, she was much taller and thinner than in real life. She was so joyful at this healing that she gave David a big hug. Well, what came to me is that Many physical healings are preceded by a spiritual healing. There is a reason for different sicknesses. Sometimes it might be forgiveness, sometimes bitterness, sometimes these things bring on judgments. Um, you know, mistreating the brethren in any way, you know, can are spiritual inner problems that need to be fixed so that a person can come out from under the curse. Because whatsoever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me, right? So mistreating Jesus is not a good thing to do. She said, I asked Father for a word concerning David, raising Sandy to her feet, and my finger was on transfigured. Well, that's interesting, Matthew 17 and 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun and his garments became white as the light. There's the white garments. Very interesting. It fits very good, doesn't it, perfectly. Okay? And, uh, of course, a transformation is coming to those who, by God's grace, have sacrificed their old life and are faithful to follow the Word. Because Revelation 12 um, tells us about this. Verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, it is by the mercy of God, no man could do such a thing, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable service. And be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed, there it is, 
by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Can you be in the perfect will of God? Well, of course. If you renew your mind with the Word of God, it's like um, renewing your hard drive, taking out the old and putting in the new, right? The manifestation of the sons of God will come first in the first fruits, man child body, to deliver God's creation, which is his children. In Romans eight, nineteen through twenty one, we're told, for the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it. So the whole creation, God knew from the beginning that he needed a Savior from the foundation of the world. Um, he ordained that Christ be the Savior for, even before Adam fell. So there was a subject to vanity that the whole creation has come into. And, of course, that's in hope that the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. So, obviously, God's children have to become sons. We talked about that in our last study. There's a difference between children and sons. Sons are manifesting Jesus Christ. Um. Children are servants until they're brought up out of that position and into a different relationship with God. However, they're accounted righteous by their faith. So as long as one walks by faith, and we're sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and uh, we're reckoned righteous through our faith, right? And I believe that this is speaking about the greatest revival the world has ever seen. The revealing of the sons of God or the manifestation of the sons of God are going to raise up the children of God into sonship. That's their job. That was what Jesus did too. And these are just following in his steps, right? Oh, praise you, Father. We're looking forward to that. Okay, then Eve had this other dream on March the 1st. And it lines up right with these others. And uh, it's, we called it kingdom authority. She said, I dreamed I was standing to the right of David in a parking lot that was surrounded by different buildings. <clears throat> well, we see a little further down that these different buildings were different churches. Okay. And, of course, you know, uh, that's who, the, who David is going to, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? who the David Manchild Ministries are going to. He was wearing stark white, there it is again, a pressed tuxedo shirt. I believe it represents holiness and righteousness and black tuxedo pants and highly polished shoes. He wasn't wearing a jacket or tie. His shirt was so white that it hurt my eyes to look at it. So instead, I focused on his hands, gesturing as he spoke with me. I noticed that on the cuffs of his shirt were two silver emerald cufflinks that were two carats each. The skin on his hands was a, an olive color, and he wore a very unusual silver engraved ring on the middle finger of his right hand. And I believe that represents the time when Mordecai was given the ring of authority uh, by the king of kings. He was a representative of the man-child in the book of Revelation. Little man is what his name means. Man-child, right? And then Eve said, uh, the middle finger is supposed to represent balance, justice, the law, responsibility, and soul-searching. The ring ran the entire length of his finger. 
and had five marquee cut jewels, each two carats, set in cathedral mountings in a row across the top. And she drew a picture of that, which we'll post too. I noticed that the silver metal of the ring was able to bend freely with his finger. Well, that's pretty supernatural, I would say. It looks like, you know, the picture looks like ring after ring after ring, but they're all made into one. And each one of them has these um, gemstones on them. The jewels were set in this order. The first, nearest his knuckle, was an emerald. The second, a ruby. The middle, a diamond. And the fourth, a blue sapphire. And the last, a topaz. Seven jewels in all. Could, could represent the seven churches, right? The thought came to me that David had five children in real life and the jewels in the ring could represent fruit. <clears throat> it could be. I, I believe that the meanings of these gems, although you could study them for quite a while because I, I noticed online that there's a lot of different ideas that people have about this, but I believe in general the meanings of these gems are, even though they're disputed, but in general I believe that the different gemstones represent different valuable attributes of Christ and uh, different authorities given because of this. Joseph's coat of many colors represents the same thing, the different colors. You know, each one of these had a different color to it. And the seven colors of light or the rainbow represent the same thing. So the, the picture is very good, um, actually. Well, I asked Father concerning these heavenly treasures that were given to David in this dream, and I received Hebrews 7, 4, uh, 1 through 4 in context. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham divided a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy. So this no earthly ancestry it represents that the old life who had that is dead. God is now Father. And that's what the Melchizedek priesthood uh, represents, someone who is dead to self. Okay? And uh, the high priest who receives the 10%, right? He, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? Uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Well, this is also true of the Melchizedek priesthood because that we are born from above. We had a life before. The life before was in the Father, just as Jesus had a beginning, as the Bible says, but his life came out of the Father. So he did have the life of the Father before. And we are the Word made flesh. The Word is eternal, but uh, and it recreates in us eternal life, right? So having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto what? The Son of God abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the chief spoils. Well, the high priest gets a tenth. As a type for the end-time man-child, Jesus was of the order of the Melchizedek high priesthood. Hebrews 6 and 20. Jesus entered for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we know that every high priest ministers both behind the veil before God and to the people. Also, an order is not just one, but a series. The next in the series is Jesus again. 
but it's Jesus manifested in the body of the corporate end-time man-child. The body of the Davids, right? Who will go behind the veil and minister to the people also. So we're, we're going to see again the ministry of Jesus. Jesus came the first time in a body of the son of David. And he's coming again in a body, which in the New Testament, bodies are multiplied into corporate bodies in the New Testament. And this is no different. Every um, Everyone in the book of Revelation, by the way, is a corporate body. They're not individuals. If you'll go and look, you'll see that. And so... This is not an uncommon thing for God to do, you know. Uh, so, you know, behind the veil and to the people, that's kind of like having always be before the throne of the Father while ministering upon the earth. We've talked about that before. Jesus said he always did those things that he saw of his Father. He was before the Father while he was ministering upon the earth. David was explaining something to me as I was focused on the jewels. He then said with frustration in his voice, Look, this got my attention on what he was talking about, and I saw what was upsetting him. And it it really was the shape of the church and its leadership. Directly in front of us was a three-story, dingy, gray building that looked like an army barracks. The door to it was on the side closest to the parking lot, That's one we spoke about before, right? And there was a long line of children who were dirty and dressed in dingy rags standing in a soup line. And all the children had dark circles around their eyes and were barefooted. Well, I believe this is God's people um, who are like beggars when they should have the riches of the kingdom benefits, right? Right? They're starving for the kingdom food of the word of God. They're barefooted because they're not walking separated from this world. And their Babylonish teachers are guilty. She went on to say, There were Catholic priests dressed in brown monk friars robes with hoods spaced throughout the line carrying a large black, carrying large black cauldrons. Well, that was very interesting. I will say in 1 Samuel 15 and 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry and teraphim. You want to know how witchcraft gets into the church? Well, it, it's not like the fairy tale witches, folks. It's, um, it's a witchcraft because they're in rebellion against God and the spirit of witchcraft is ruling there. So the priests were in this line of people with these large black cauldrons. And uh, I believe that the Catholics here representing universal apostate religion, uh, and they're rebelling against the Word of God to be all-inclusive of many religious backgrounds. They just want to include it. They just were a mixture of all religious backgrounds at the time when Constantine wanted a united kingdom. And it was the early universal church. There is no such thing. But this is where Catholicism came from, and it's a type and a shadow here. I'm convinced this is not talking about Catholics, but the type and the shadow here. It's a Babylon mother of harlots that's out there. As I watched the head priest dressed in black robes, as Satanists wear, by the way, and wearing a witch doctor's headdress that looked like a buffalo head, in other words, a hard-headed beast, right? With a painted mask for the face, uh, I would say masquerading as priests of the Lord, because you know what a priest of the Lord is, and that's not it. Came up to the line and opened the lid to one of the cauldrons. My vision became telescopic as I was able to see what was in the cauldron. It was a boiling broth of human body parts. Okay, I think this represents people who, by deception have dismembered God's people from the real body of Christ. Evil evil leadership is living by taking advantage of God's people, plundering them, feeding on their fleshly ignorance of God's promises. 
He said, I watched him nod in approval as he dipped his finger into the pot to taste it. Well, this is the verse that came to me, uh, Micah 3, 1 through 4, and it fits it perfectly. And I said, here, I pray ye, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off the skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not answer them. Yea, he will hide his face from them at that time, according as they have wrought evil in their doings. That is, these people who have brought God's people into bondage to religion rather than Christianity. And there's a lot of it out there. It's not only the mother, it's the mother of all the daughter harlots. After this, I was with my son, Josiah, instead of David. And I believe both are types of the man-child, but Josiah stresses the reformer point better than a lot of other types. But he is with the bride and going first to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel, representing the church. Because we can see, she said, we were walking on the grass. And we know that all flesh is as grass, so the flesh is under their feet or under their dominion. This is the people that God is going to use, the people who have their flesh under dominion. They're going to use them for the people who are in captivity, to bring them out of captivity. We were near the parking lot heading to all the different churches surrounding it. Well, just as Jesus and his disciples did, they went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? I knew in the dream that society had suffered something devastating to people's lives, and everything had changed. There were these soup lines, and everyone had crowded into these churches to try to find some relief. Well, I would say in a time of apocalyptic shaking and turmoil, the people realized that their spiritual poverty and um, seek spiritual food in the places familiar to them, which is apostate Christianity. Many people who begin in the kingdom begin there. They begin with the basics, you know. Some don't even get that. But they begin there because they have the wrong idea of what is important and what is popular, which is never right, you know. Uh, they think, oh, this is a big church, you know, and it's pretty nice looking, well, and the preacher's really nice guy, you know. Well, they get caught up into it, and um, and sometimes it takes them a while, but God's getting ready to do a new thing here, at least new in our age, not new to history. Well, what they find there, of course, is a soup line instead of the milk and the meat that they need. Isaiah 30 and 20 says, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be hidden any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Uh, God's going to open their eyes to see the difference between the soup lines and the real food that sustains people, empowers people, causes them to walk in the steps of Jesus. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. That's the original word that the churches have forgotten. Saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. But as we see in this dream, the man, child, and bride will bring the real food for their starving souls. Just as Jesus did in his disciples, right? History is going to repeat. Worldwide is going to repeat. Praise God. All the church buildings were, were different. There was the Catholic, quote, army barracks, unquote. And next to that was a fancy modern-looking apartment building. An apartment represents uh, many houses of peoples put together into one house which can represent a fake church, as in this case. 
uh, imitating the real church. The words about the real church in Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Of course, you know, the Catholic Church speaks about Peter being the first pope, <laughs> which he never was. Uh, but he was the true foundation. He was in the true foundation because he shared the the real word of God, which they ignore. Many many uh, churches claim certain famous men to, who began their their religion, but the truth is, when you look at the lives and the words of these men, they have nothing to do with these people. They just claim them. Christ Jesus Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom each several building, that's each individual building, fit, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. And this is in the Spirit. It's not in the flesh. We don't have to be, you know, like we join together here. You join with me, and we're across the country, but we're joined in spirit, not necessarily in flesh like, you know, religion generally does. We went into the apartment building up to the second floor and saw a sister there. She went, she went up to her, we went up to her to ask her about the building and see if there was any room for us to sleep there for the night. She explained all the building's amenities like a professional realtor, but in the end, said that there wasn't any available space. She seemed very proud of the building, though, as they are. All but notice there's no space in this prosperity church for the man, child, or mom. Does that sound familiar? It reminds me of Luke 2 and 7, where it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And I suppose in these days, the same situation. They won't find room for the man, child, and bride. Those people who hang out with their religion and don't come out from among them, they will do the same thing as the Pharisees and their people did to Jesus and the disciples. Right? History always repeats. So, don't be shocked if you get rejected, right? After this, Josiah and I walked over to the next church building. It looked like a big barn and had many animal stalls in it on the different floors with wooden bunks in each stall. Each bunk was covered with a green wool army blanket. Sounds like martial law as, the, as Israel was under, by the way, when man-child Jesus was born. The Roman martial law. We saw another sister sitting on the left side, left inside a stall, and we asked her also if there was any room for us to stay the night. Each stall we looked into, she would loudly tell us, Oh, you can't sleep there. That's so-and-so's bunk. Or, No, that one is taken too. Then she said, You won't find anything. It's all been taken. In other words, once again, we get back to the same thing. A religion is not going to accept these people. The religion isn't. The people that come out of the religion will accept the man-child and bride's ministry. So here Eve and her man-child son, Josiah, can find no room even in a barn <laughs> with beastly animals, uh, meaning those Christians, loosely using the term, uh, not born of the word. Could this be pointing to the birth of the man-child body? Once again, Luke 2 and 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So here's a likely place for a manger in a barn. So how many spiritual people have felt uncomfortable in the beastly churches? Well, most anybody that listens to us very long has felt that way. Because that's not church. That's um, a fake church. Well, people in this dream had lost everything, even loved ones, she said, and, and were packed into these places like sardines. Well, if you remember, after 911, so many went to church to find out what was happening in this apocalyptic event then. 
only to find no answers but the same old swill and, and ceremony. And they usually left shortly thereafter. The churches filled up and they emptied very quickly. Can't imagine why. I asked Father for a word concerning these churches and the devastating event in the dream and received Daniel 4.10. And uh, this text is about the kingdom of Babylon, which is a political as well as a spiritual entity. And uh, she is the mother of the daughter of harlots in 10 through 17 in context. Thus were the visions of my head upon my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, just like the Tower of Babel, by the way, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. So Babylonish Christian religion covers the globe, right? The leaves thereof were fair, and uh, the fruit thereof much, and in it was food for all the beasts of the field. They had shadow under it, and the birds of the heavens dwelt in the branches thereof, and all flesh was fed from it. And I do mean flesh. The spiritual hogwash that covers the earth and the fleshly beasts that love it, along with the unclean birds, that are in Babylon's prison houses, uh, which are ruled over by demons, according to Revelation 18 and 2. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, is become the habitation of demons, a hold, or a prison, of every unclean spirit, and a hold, or prison, of every unclean and hateful bird. So you'll find more demons in there than out of there. <laughs> And verse 13 goes on, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from its branches. Now this is good news. How else will the beastly find spirituality except they come out of her, my people? Because they realize that their leadership has turned to madness. And that's what the rest of the story is about. They're going to op get their eyes open to the madness of these Babylonish leaders. Nevertheless, leave the stump of its roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass. Uh, well, once again, uh, all flesh is as grass, in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, we've talked a lot about this in the political realm of Babylon, but what about the religious realm of Babylon? Well, that's obviously why this text was given, because God is also going to take away the mind of the religious part of Babylon. The apostate leadership will be recognized during the tribulation just as they were in Jesus' day. God's going to open people's eyes. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. So the, the leadership was given the mind of a beast so that the people could see that these were not who everybody thought they were. Isaiah 32 and 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, that's, I believe, Jesus, and princes shall rule in justice, that's those that are working for him, not probably the man-child ministry, and a man, Jesus, shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert, from the tempest, as streams of water in a dry place. There you go. 
real water in a place where people are very thirsty. The thirst that God's going to put in the people and the revelation of who their leadership actually is is going to deliver them out of bondage. As the shade of a great rock in a weary land, so they will flee the shelters and soup lines of man and go to the rock. Oh, praise the Lord. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. And the heart of the rash shall understand knowledge. I mean, this is a gift from God to people to set them free, to bring his people out of Babylonish bondage, right? And the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. Now listen to this. The fool shall be no more called noble. That's interesting. I think they're pretty well called noble today. They act noble. They dress noble. And the people kind of bow down to them. But the noble is a prince, right? Nor the churl... Uh, which I believe represents a selfish, coarse deceiver, said to be bountiful. Uh, Well, we know a lot of people like that, you know, leadership, proud, arrogant, taking authority where they don't need to, uh, deceiving people, using them, you know. So, yep. The curl will no longer be known to be bountiful. I bet the prosperity folks won't understand this. Uh, For the fool will speak folly. Now, you look out in the political realm, we've heard of this parallel. Look at the people who are speaking folly. How could this happen? Well, he turned them over to factious spirits, for one thing, the same spirits that the church has been dealing with. And they make absolutely no sense. They no longer have a conscience towards the word. There's a great falling away among them. And God wants to identify the leadership to the people so that they will flee and come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch the unclean thing. I'll be to you a father, and you'll be to me sons and daughters. He said, for the fool will speak folly, and his heart will work iniquity to practice profaneness and to utter error against the Lord. Well, it's certainly happening in the faction for sure. It's happening in the political realm, too. The parallel has been holding true. Okay, and I want to say that denominationalism is also a faction on a larger scale than what has been happening recently. But they speak very foolish of the Lord. They don't know the Lord. They know what their Bible schools taught them. They know they've got authority through their certificate, but they don't have any authority from God, just like the Pharisees who saw the authority Jesus had. And he spoke with as one with authority. Of course, the disciples of Jesus are going to do the same thing in these days, right? So uh, the Lord says, listen to it again, for the fool will speak folly. His heart will work iniquity to practice profaneness and to utter error against the Lord. So God is forcing this revelation of the nature of, and the sin in the church leadership, just as he has in the political leadership. Nothing can be kept hidden. And so uh, they spoke, uh, they utter error against the Lord to make empty the soul of the hungry and to cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. 
and the instruments of the churl are evil. Again, I, as I did a little research on it, I felt the churl means somebody who is selfish, who is coarse, and who is a deceiver. The instruments of the churl are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the meek with lying words, even when the needy speaketh right. But I would say the true noble, my my word true there, the true noble deviseth noble things, and in noble things shall he continue. I believe this is speaking of the new reformer ministries that the Lord is going to give his people in these days for this awesome, great revival. Isn't God good? There is a great falling away. There has been since shortly after the time of Jesus and his disciples. And some have only studied those parts that are a falling away. They haven't studied the Scripture You wonder why they say they believe the Scriptures and never read it. How can this be? Well, I want to say when religious spirits rule over people, because there are spirits whose job it is to keep people in bondage to religion, because religion has no power, and it will not recreate in you the life of Christ, for they don't use the only seed that God uses to do that with, which is the Word. So they don't use that. It's a delusion. It's the devil's fake Christianity. And the Lord is about to reveal these people to anybody that has any gift of God. Now, there are people in those religions that they're just religious. They have no gift of God. Like many of you, I pass through a couple of religions, and uh, realized, well, this isn't it. I've been reading the Bible, and this isn't it, and I kept on going. But there are people that were in there for 40, 50, 60 years, you know, and still there, and still not growing in God, and still in bondage, and still uh, thinking it all passed away in the time of Christ or some other such foolishness, you know. So, you know, uh, God is going to spring his people that are his because there are some of his. I passed through there. I was his. I knew it. I passed through there because I was reading diligently. And he is going to put the same uncomfortableness in the people that are his uh, and and put it in their hearts to come out from among them and be separate. He's going to do it. He's going to spring. There's going to, out from these um, houses of prisons, you know, with uh, demons ruling over them. He's going to deliver them. Now, over the years, I've prayed over people that had religious spirits. The spirit, I mean, they couldn't understand what you said. They couldn't understand what was wrong with with what they were doing and how they were doing it. And then, when you cast the religious spirit out of them, suddenly God starts showing them things. Well, he can do that anytime, and he will do it. And uh, it's going to be a wondrous move of God, saints, a wondrous move of God. And, Father, we just thank you for opening the eyes of our brothers and sisters who have been in bondage. Um, and we ask you, O oh Lord, to have mercy upon them, discernment upon them, When these things come upon the world, Lord, and they begin to think, oh, my gosh, we are in the end times. (laughs) And they look around, and they see no answer, and they see their leadership falling into every kind of sin and, and degradation, and they get curious to read the Bible. They read the Bible, and they see it doesn't line up with their religion, and And there they go again. They're sprung. They've been sprung from prison. 
And Lord, we just thank you for doing a mighty move of your spirit to do this, Lord. Pour out your spirit on peoples and and everywhere. Let this revival that's coming cause them to wake up to the fact that it's all still true. As my good friend Ray years, years ago, who was a Baptist Bible school teacher, suddenly got a revelation. God just popped it in his heart. It's And he would say it. It's all still true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's right. You got it. It's all still true. And uh, that's how he sprung him out of that uh, hold or prison to go out and speak the truth to people. Oh, glory be to God. <laughs> Well, we thank you, Father, for that in the name of Jesus. And um, thank you, Lord, for this wisdom of yours. And uh, we bless the brethren out there that are listening. My Lord Jesus, oh Jesus, I trust in you. I trust in you.